Right, so um, this is regression automata, applications in wind speed and power prediction. Uh, it's work performed by Quinlan, Christian Hammersmith, Gaetano Pellegrino, and Sico Weber. Uh, unfortunately, none of the authors could actually make it today um, due to uh, unavoidable circumstances. So I'm just a colleague of Christian Hammersmith, and I'll be acting as your glorified text-to-speech translator. Um, I can't even see the slides here, which will be problematic. Um, so I'm just going to take one second. So um, yes, the authors are actually right now um, using this chat. So if you have any questions and you wish to direct it to them, uh, you can actually use this chat. Um, I believe it's 2 a.m. right now in Europe, so they are awake and waiting the questions, so please make sure they stay awake. Um, right, so why use syntactic models in time series? Well, syntactic models are traditionally used for grammatical interfe inference, and uh, the idea is to get a collected set of uh, observed uh, sequences, and uh, from those build a prefix tree, and from this prefix tree merge states in order to find um, the smallest finite state automata that actually models these observed um, sequences. Now, the advantages of, um, of using symbolic representation is that they tend to be robust to noise data, noise data and they provide um, a certain bounds that actually reflect the uh, prediction uncertainty. In syntactic models as well, you're able to actually extract the uh, formal grammar out of, the, uh, out of the data, and you're able to impose limits on the model and the complexity of this. Right, so um, traditional um, syntactic models basically take as an input symbolic, um, a, symbolic, a set of symbolic data and output symbolic data as well. So traditionally what you do is you actually, through discretization, you transform numerical data into symbolic data. One of these drawbacks, of course, is that the predictions that you make on this series is actually symbols, not actual values. And in a conventional time series model, what you predict, uh, the, one of the drawbacks is the sensitivity to noise, and usually it's quite hard to uh, get a high level abstraction of the model. So the idea of the regression automata is to use both symbolic and numeric data in order to output symbolic and numeric output. Um, so instead of actually doing this discretization step, what, uh, what the authors are doing in this work, they're actually using both numeric data and symbolic data. So there is an initial step of the data preprocessing, which is, uh, in this case, they tried several methods, including k-means clustering, but uh, the most uh, optimal method uh, was the symbolic aggregation, aggregate approximation, or SACS. So the idea is to firstly normalize the raw data and compressing it by turning it into piecewise aggregate approximations. And by doing this, you're actually reducing the dimensions um, from to a certain set of uh, alphabet symbols. So in this particular case, you can see in the graph, uh, the raw data is 48 points, and uh, the uh, PAAs uh, are four of them, each one including 12 points, and they each have an assigned alphabet letter, in this case, CCAC. Um, in addition, instead of using the absolute power for each point, they're, they're actually using the difference between consecutive points. This is useful for stabilizing the mean of the time series and eliminating any trend. So here we have a, an example of how to build uh, the prefix tree automaton. So we have nine points, and as you ah yeah, we have uh, nine points uh, that are after the Sachs dimension reduction, and you can see the uh, the assigned letter that each point receives after the uh, the bins or boundaries have been created. And you'll notice, like I mentioned, that there's using difference between points rather than the absolute value. So the initial point of A, uh, of the initial point, has a value of zero because there's no previous point to actually do the difference. And then in order to build this prefix tree, they actually look at the, tra of the um, uh, difference between each consecutive point. So with a window length of two, you can see that you go from the point A0 to B055, and then from B055 to C055, etc. And this is how you start building um, iteratively the uh, prefix tree. Uh, great. So in this case, for example, you, let's try and build the, um, the state. How is the state Q5 built? Well, if we look at the, at the previous uh, slide, we can see that there are three points that start off from the state C, uh, namely the third, the fifth, and the seventh. 
And what they do is then the value to assign to that state Q5 is actually the average or mean of the, of the differences to getting from that state. So in this case, minus 0 0.6, 0 0.52, and 0 0.07. So by doing this for every pairwise um, points, they're able to build the prefix tree. So let's, how can we actually use this prefix tree to predict um, some new point? Well, let's take the last point in the series, um, which is 1.3. Now that would be labeled as C based on our boundaries. And therefore what we would do is we would start in the initial state and follow it with a C to the next state. And therefore the predicted value would be uh, 1.3 plus the value at that particular state, in this case being minus 0 0.35. So the predicted value would be 0 0.95. Now what this means is that the prefix tree should be seen as a mapping from patterns of, uh, of the alphabet to an actual drift value in the wind. Right, so uh, in addition to building the prefix tree, we now need to reduce it to a deterministic finite automata. So the process to do this is done through a state merging. Now this is just iteratively testing the Markov assumption, which means that through uh, a state might have different past processes. However, as long as the future processes are same or similar, then you're able to perform a merge. So in this case, what do we define by being similar? We don't use the traditional statistical or input-output consistency checks, but rather we look at if the, uh, the change in drift is actually similar. So for example, in the, in the shown um, prefix tree, you can see that states Q1 and Q3 have a similar uh, difference, and in the same manner, Q5 and Q8. So this could be candidates for the merge. There is, of course, a certain threshold that needs to be adjusted to what we define as similar. So um, the next, the next uh, part of the process is deciding which, um, which states are actually going candidates to being merged. Now the uh, technique they use is the red-blue framework, and the idea is that you start labeling your, um, your states as red or blue, starting from the root node, and you uh, are only able to merge between a red and a blue state. And once a merge occurs, then you, um, you take the new state and you label it as red. So this is basically a heuristic to avoid having to do all of the comparisons between states in the entire tree. Um, now, of course, there is a possibility during um, a merge that there's two candidates with similar uh, drift distance. Now, uh, what the technique used in order to determine which one to use is the Akaiki information criterion. Now, the problem is that this is quite a greedy algorithm. However, this is only done uh, when there is a conflict of which states to merge. You can see in the calculation, they, they use the number of parameters in the model and the log of the residual error before and after the merge. So in other words, you try both merges, you calculate which one provides you with the highest information gain, and then you take that one. And this is the, uh, the actual learned model for the specific example of wind power, uh, wind speed, sorry. And you can see that there's about 20 states, and you can actually start from the very start node, and by looking at the, at the pattern of the wind, you can actually find what the predicted drift will be. So here are some examples. If you start with the pattern ABC, I basically continually, continuously increasing, then the predicted drift would be to actually continue increasing. Um, in a similar manner, if it's decreasing, but you can find interesting values, such as if the, high sp if the wind has been very high for a long time, it's actually predicted to go down. So it provides you with a model that it's easy to interpret and visualize. So there were two main case studies, uh, one about the wind speed prediction and another one about the uh, wind power prediction. And there are three sets of tests, one for the one hour ahead prediction, three hour ahead, and six hour ahead. Now, um, the, the actual values used to build the prefix trees are the same, it's just that the resulting value at the end is the one for the one hour, three hour, six hour. It doesn't mean that we're using la larger windows. The window size for all of these is always eight. Um, and as you can see, for the one-hour prediction, uh, ARIMA seems to perform better. However, as we try to predict further and further, um, the um, regression automata seems to perform best. Uh, some of the other models include, rec include recurrent neural networks and persistence models. We get a similar um, situation for the prediction of the wind power. Uh, which is particularly interesting since um, traditionally because of the threshold for actually generating power due to the wind, most models tend to perform um, much worse. And finally, there is a comparison of the model complexity, uh, mainly with regards to the um, prefix tree, because one of the stages is to build a prefix tree and then to reduce it into the uh, regression automata. 
And um, you can see here the performance gains by actually performing this state merging. And although it's not shown on the, on the graphs, on the tables here, uh, normally the number of states in the uh, resulting solution is to a 50 to 100 ratio difference, meaning that the result is much smaller. And in terms of uh, runtime comparisons, uh, I have to note here that uh, the implementation of the neural network um, might not have been optimal, so this is why I take it with a grain of salt. Uh, but at least the, uh, the main factor here is to prove that going from a prefix tree to going to a regression automata is actually relatively fast. Oh, and it's worth mentioning as well, if you look at the length four and length eight, that the regression automata actually generalizes really well since the values for the RSME is actually very similar. So in conclusions, the higher the order of the regression, or in this case, the size of the sliding window length, the larger the advantage of this merging process of the um, prefix tree. And uh, state merging heuristics can actually perform, uh, find a um, small finite automata very fast. And what they have proposed is a new met method for learning DFAs from time series using both numerical and symbolic data. And the heuristic for finding the consistency and guiding the merging process is novel. And yes, they show that the actual prediction is, uh, has good accuracy while giving an actual result that can be observed and analyzed, namely the 20 state resulting automata. And again, please, any questions? Don't hesitate to ask them. Thank you.